It's amazing how a few letters stitched together into words and then stitched together into sentences can turn our lives upside down. We're pregnant. You're hired. Will you marry me? You've won the lottery. Sometimes those letters stitched together into words, stitched together into sentences, can inspire us. I have a dream. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. You can do it. The Seahawks aren't going to be all that great this year. And when you take some of these letters and you stitch them together and you put them into words, we can find that they will frustrate us. Detour ahead. Bathrooms closed for cleaning. Your wait time is 30 minutes. And your flight has been canceled. And of course, then there are those words. When we stitch letters together, we create words, and then we create sentences. These words and sentences can shock us. They blindside us. They knock us off our comfort zone. And they're words that we find a hard time trying to translate into our own lives. It's cancer. You're fired. I don't love you anymore. There's nothing more we can do for you. You see, words have power. Words can make our hearts sore, or words can break our hearts. Words, sentences, can heal us. They can give us hope. They can inspire us. They can challenge us. They can tear us down. Words have power. Now, it should come as no surprise that the Bible, being a book, is a book full of words. And sometimes those words are stitched together to share history with us. Sometimes they're stitched together to tell us stories. Sometimes they're used to create poetry. Sometimes those words bring comfort to us. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Sometimes those words will challenge us. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Sometimes they'll inspire us. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not arrogant, boastful, or rude. Sometimes they'll just confuse us. You should not put on a garment made of two different materials. And then there are all those words in Scripture that shock us, that blindside us, that knock us out of our comfort zone. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Do not repay evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Words have power. And perhaps the most shocking words of all come to us from Jesus. Nine words that he says from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, to appreciate why those words are so shocking, we need to remind ourselves of just how close Jesus was with God, the kind of intimate relationship Jesus had with his heavenly Father. At his baptism, God said publicly, you are my beloved son, I'm fully pleased with you. Throughout his mission and his ministry, Jesus constantly claimed equality with God, said that he and God worked in combination with each other, that Jesus was constantly carrying out the will of his Father. Jesus referred to God as Abba, which is a, a very intimate word, meaning daddy. And again, just before he made his way into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, God said once again out loud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. So if we know anything about Jesus, it's that he was secure in the love of his Father. And yet now, on the cross, Jesus cries out in horror because it appears that God has abandoned him. And hanging on the cross, what else could he conclude? Now, part of the reason why these words are so shocking is because of what it says about us and our relationship with God. If God would abandon Jesus, his beloved son, when Jesus needed him the most, what hope do we possibly have? Words matter. And what's interesting about these words from the cross is that behind these words of despair are words of hope. You see, when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was quoting the first line from a psalm, Psalm 22. 
And all of the Jewish people standing around the cross at that moment would know that when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was referring to that psalm and that there was more to the story than just that line of despair. Let me give you an example. When I say four score and seven years ago, most of you know that that's the opening phrase from Abraham Lincoln's greatest speech given at Gettysburg during the Civil War. And those of us who have memorized that little speech, those of us who have not memorized it, know that there's more to the story. Four score and seven years ago brings up the rest of it. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men and women are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. And then it goes on for just another couple minutes. Behind that line was the rest of the story. And the same is true when Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The people standing at the cross knew that there was more to that psalm than just that line of despair. You see, Psalm 22 is a prayer. And it's the interplay between the very real moments of absence of God that we experience in life, as Jesus experienced on the cross, followed up by the promise of God that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And so the psalm goes back and forth between this moment of forsakenness and the promise of God's steadfast love. And so when Jesus is hanging on the cross, he is saying something profound to us. In the midst of his sense of abandonment, he is proclaiming that God is still there. And so what Jesus is saying to us is this. God's silence is not God's absence. God's absence is not God's abandonment. The cross suggested that God had forsaken Jesus, but the promise of God said that God was there all along. We may not always see what God is doing. We may not always feel God's presence, but the promise of God is that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And that's what Jesus was proclaiming. In the midst of that abandonment, he knew God was there. And so he could go from, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, in one breath, to the next line saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He may have felt abandoned, but the promise said that God's hands were there to catch him when he breathed his last. Words have power, and words matter. And when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's entering into solidarity with you when you feel abandoned by God. But he's also proclaiming a promise to you. A promise that you can bank your life on no matter how, what kind of sense you have about what God is doing in your life in that moment. And here's what, how Paul summarizes it. Who will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You may feel forsaken in this moment, but the promise of God that Jesus shares with you on the cross is that nothing absolutely nothing will separate you from God's love. And right now, God is with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that promise that when we feel your absence, when we feel your abandonment, when we hear that silence, we thank you for the promise that Jesus experienced on the cross that you will never leave us nor forsake us. No matter how tough it is, your grace is deeper. In Jesus' name, amen.